Good morning. Welcome to First Union Church. It's good to see each and every one of you here. We're missing a few today, but I don't know where they've gone to. What better place could you be here? Right, Fred? Yes. From a guy that would prefer to be in Arizona, he said, yes, it's good to be here. <laughs> so, uh, bow for a moment and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time which we can take a part in giving to missions. And we are um, grateful that we can support different missionaries. We have some here locally at Cedar Bay, and then there's others further away. And we look forward to when they get a chance to come and visit us. But God, right now we, we are taking up this collection to help support this ministry of First Union Church. We pray a blessed gift and the giver alike. In Jesus' name, amen. Hopefully that got the heartbeat going and now we're all awake. Let's continue with 311. Quite different, quite opposite, the spirit song, number 311.
This morning, this message is the third of a four-part series of topical sermons. I hope you'll find this to be an interesting title, A Brief History of Sin. We love to talk about repentance, and so we should, and we love to talk about grace and restoration, and we very much should. But sometimes we do need to be reminded about the nature of what we're dealing with. And so I'm going to ask you, if you're able to, to stand. Turn to Romans chapter 5. We'll be reading verse 12 to 15. As this is our leaping off point for a message focused on the doctrine of sin and its four eras. You might say four eras, and I say yes, stay tuned and you'll find out. Hear now from Romans 5, verse 12 to 15, is the word of the Lord. Therefore, as sin entered into the world through one man, and death through sin, so death passed to all men, because all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not charged when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sins weren't like Adam's disobedience, who is a foreshadowing of him who was to come. But the free gift isn't like the trespass. For if by the trespass of one, the many died, much more did the grace of God by the gift of the grace of one man, Jesus Christ, has abounded to many. Please be seated. So let me begin this morning with a brief story. It's about a man who was asked to the exterior of his church. It was a big job. He was going to need a lot of paint. So to save money, he decided to try to dilute the paint a bit. As he started applying it, it went on well. Actually, it looked very good. And he was just about to finish the, the last section of the west-facing wall of the church. But he heard a loud clap of thunder in the sky followed by a downpour so mighty he half expected to see Noah float by. And very quickly he discovered that large sections of the diluted paint had literally just washed right off the wall. He didn't know what to do, so he calls up his pastor. And he says, what am I supposed to do? And his pastor gave him the ultimate biblically correct answer. His pastor said, repaint, repaint and thin no more. <laughs> But the reality is that understanding the nature of sins, we have to just realize how difficult it is to truly repent and sin no more. So let's look at the sin issue at its roots in order to better understand the, the depth but even the nature of this problem. So I'm going to ask you to think back, if you would, to your school days. For some of you, by the way, your school days were fairly recent. For some of us, I have a hunch that you're in the history books that the students study. But you may recall from your science classes that there are actually four states of matter. When you were growing up, you probably thought there were three, because that's what I was taught. There's solid, liquid, gas, and plasma, which is something of an advanced derivative of gas. And likewise, there's four dimensions in physical space. There's depth, and then how they change over the passage of time, the dimension of time. That being said, there's also four eras of sin, and we'll look at those in a second. But first, let's focus on the nature of the problem that we are wrestling with. I found a few quotes that may help us. Here's one from Charles Spurgeon, well-known pastor in London in the late 1800s. He wrote, as salt flavors every drop of the Atlantic, so does sin affect every atom of our nature. It is so sadly there, so abundantly there, and if you cannot detect it, it's because you are deceived. That from Charles Spurgeon. A couple hundred years earlier, also in England, a British theologian, John Owen, wrote the following, Be killing sin, or it will be killing you. Back in the 1800s, in this case in South Africa, a minister named Andrew Murray 
One great power of sin is that it blinds us so that we do not recognize its true character. And then lastly, one of my favorites, as you know, Martin Luther, who wrote the following, the recognition of sin is the beginning of salvation. Until we recognize that we're sinners, we have no basis to repent. The big question I think that we would have to ask ourselves is why do we sin? If we know what we're supposed to do and we know what we're not supposed to do, why do we still sin? It's a fair question that deserves a straightforward answer, but we can't move forward on understanding sin until we at least attempt to grasp the nature of the battle that we're in. The Apostle Paul struggled with this issue very much. A couple chapters after what we read earlier, in Romans 7, he writes the following, and I'm reading a paraphrased version to make it a little bit easier to follow, but even then, Paul's writing is often something of a grammatical train wreck. But here's what he said, essentially. He said, I really don't understand myself, for when I want to do what's right, I still don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. But if I know that what I'm doing is wrong, this shows I agree that the law is good. So if I am not the one doing wrong, it must be sin living in me that does it. But I know that nothing good lives in me. That's my sinful nature. I want to do what's right, but I can't. I want to do what's good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. But if I do what I don't want to do, I am not really the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. Now, that's a, that's a paraphrased version, and even then that's hard to follow. In the classic translation, to read the King James rendering of that, you can tell that Paul is just about tied in knots over the reality that he knows better, but he still does the wrong thing. Really, that comes down to, he's saying this, why do I not just do what I'm supposed to do? Why do I still do the things I know I should not do? Well, the reason is we live in a fallen world. We're born with a sin nature that we received from our ancestors. Even when we don't want to sin, there's a war inside of us. We often don't want to deal with the consequences. It's just easier to go with the flow. A couple of verses that may help us to understand why it's so difficult. Matthew 26, 41, Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is, is willing, but the flesh is weak. There's a pretty well-known passage. Or 1 John 2, verse 15 to 16. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. So I'm describing what almost sounds like a catch-22 situation. Even when we want to do the right thing, we're limited in our ability to do the right thing. And even when we achieve the goal of doing the right thing on a particular issue, we fail on another issue. And the reason is we have a sin problem. We all do. I do. Everything that's wrong with us, with our world, with our relationships, with our health, even with our minds, ultimately can be traced back directly or indirectly to the presence of sin in the world. Not necessarily our own sin, but the accumulated effects of sin long before we were born. And yet there are many people who will, they'll deny this reality. They'll tell us something like this. They'll say, well, sin is just an allegory for the struggle between good and evil. They'll say bad things that happen are random chance. They'll say that wrong actions in the world are just the result of a lack of love in the world. And you know, you could make those applications, but they're naive because they don't attempt to explain why those things are the case. Those things exist because we live in a fallen world. Sin is real, its impact is unavoidable, its consequences are deadly in this life and in eternity. Indeed, death itself is here because sin entered the world. Think about that. If Adam and Eve had not sinned, there would be no such thing as death. Sometimes people say, well, death is just a part of life. My response is, that's a half-truth. Death is a part of life in a fallen world. But death is a curse that came upon humanity because sin entered into the world. It came upon us because Adam and Eve did not listen to what God said. 
So it's a rather bleak look at the nature of what we're dealing with. And quite honestly, neither you nor I know the half of it because we've been impacted by it. The effects of sin on all that we know and all that we are gives us these blinders in which we don't realize the full scope of it. Now I know that's a rather stark assessment, but having considered the nature of sin, let's focus on the history, and I'm going to call it the future of sin. We may not think of it this way, but as matter has four states and space has four dimensions, sin has four eras. And you might say, now you've got me curious. So without sounding like a play on words, here are those eras, and I'll talk you through each of them. First is when man was able to sin, then he's not able to not sin, then he's able to not sin, and one day will be not able to sin. Now think about that for a second, and let's unpack that. It sounds like the kind of stereotype alliteration that preachers use, often to the eye-rolling of much of their congregation. But we have to understand the depth of what we're dealing with. It's true we don't fully grasp it, and we're not going to, but we need to at least get the basics, because it helps to, to point our attention forward to what is the great hope of the Christian faith. So let's talk about the, the first era. Man was able to sin. This is in original creation. Everything God made was good. In fact, it wasn't only good. God said it was very good. Genesis 1 and 2. That's the first era of sin. In the garden, Adam and Eve had a perfect existence. Truly a paradise. No hunger, no pain, no worry, no strife, no death, no sin. But sin was possible. Man was able to sin. In that sense, you could make the argument they had free will. But remember, whatever amount of free will they may or may not have have, we have less of it because we have a fallen will. Our will is in bondage to sin. In fact, that was one of the main points that Martin Luther used at the beginning of the Protestant Reformation, 1525, a, a treatise he wrote, famous treatise, called On the Bondage of the Will. But this takes us to where you cross over to the second era of sin. Man's not able to not sin. In Genesis 3, creation is changed. Literally, the sun, the moon, the stars, the planets, the ground, the animals, the plants, and Adam, too, and Eve. They were all changed to a fallen condition. And yet, even the inanimate objects were impacted. All of creation was groaning. But the most profound and insidious impact of that event was that now the relationship between humans and God had a barrier. Um, theologians will sometimes say it was just a chasm that was between us and him. And to make things worse, it's a situation that's so bad that people, whether it be Adam and Eve back then or you and I, now have a sin nature. It means we will sin. Whereas Adam and Eve were placed in the Garden of Eden, it means that they could sin. Genesis 3 gives us the account of how the serpent tempts Eve. The rest is well known to us. But it changed everything, but it especially changed our relationship with our Creator, and it changed our relationship with one another. That's why the first and the second eras of sin are so different. In the first era, man was able to sin, and unfortunately he did. In the second era, because we now have a sin nature, man is not able to not sin. Even when Adam and Eve wanted to do right, they were unable to always do so because their very will, along with their mind and their body, were now fallen. Now, if I may, I would like to say this is, I'm going to call it a Charles Stanley moment. You remember Charles Stanley just recently went to be with him. He always had these points in his sermons where he would say, now listen, listen. Well, here's the Charles Stanley moment. When Adam and Eve ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they were changed. Everything changed. Everything in that moment changed. Sin entered the world, and that's why death entered the world. And to make things even worse, there was now no way to avoid it, and therefore no way to avoid physical death. I'll share with you a reality this morning, and that's, I am going to die someday. And statistically speaking, it's a lot closer than what it used to be. I have probably lived at least 80% of my lifespan. Probably. Reason? 
because sin entered the world all those years ago and death came with it. That is an unavoidable truth. But God had a plan and he set it in motion right away. From Genesis chapter 3 up to today, his plan has been that he's going to send the Messiah. And in the Old Testament, the law was given to show people that they were sinners and that they had no hope on their own, but their hope and their faith was to be in the Messiah who was yet to come. And when he came to the earth and went to the cross, he fulfilled the law on our behalf. When he rose again from the grave, he showed he'd fully paid the price to purchase our salvation. And it is available to all who repent and place their faith in him. So today, many, perhaps most, God knows their hearts, I don't, but many are living still in this second era of sin. By themselves, there's nothing they can do to prevent themselves from sinning again and again, and there's nothing they can do to save themselves from eternal separation from God when death comes to their human body. Essentially, they have no hope for the future unless something happens and intervenes to change the equation. And that something is only one thing. The Holy Spirit of God moves upon the heart of an unregenerate person and the person answers that call, and they come to a saving faith in Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, the only one who can make things right between us and God. And that's how people enter from the second to the third era. When a person places their faith in Christ, there's now a level of resistance to sin that there wasn't before. In some instances, in some instances, we are able to not sin because the Holy Spirit has given us a strength we did not have before. Now, we don't achieve sinless perfection. And, of course, we still have the effects of not only our past sin and its consequences, but the accumulative effects of sin throughout the history. But there's a huge difference. We've been given a regenerated heart, and the biggie is we've been declared innocent because we're justified by faith, not by our works. That's the difference between the second and the third era, is trusting in Jesus Christ. Through repentance and faith, we cross over into this era in which, yes, we still sin, but it is no longer held against us. Having been justified by faith, we are now being sanctified by the Holy Spirit, who conforms us more and more into the likeness of Christ. That's the third era of sin. So what's the fourth? Well, the fourth era is a time that's yet to come. It speaks of eternity in the Lord's presence on the new earth, the new heaven and the new earth, when God restores all of his original creation to its original sinless glory. We receive glorified, resurrected bodies that will be like Adam and Eve had. Bodies that don't get sick, don't grow old. People that don't fight with one another. No more war. No more death. But until that day, every one of us that's alive is in either the second or the third era of sin. For those of you who like visuals like me, you can look at this and you can see some idea that we're all in era two or three. When you look at it like this and you recognize that there's two key questions everybody should ask themselves. Which era are you in? And if you're in the second era, this is kind of the part B of the question, how do you get to the third era? Because that determines your eternal destination. The answer, repent, confess you're a sinner, you're lost without Christ, accept that Jesus is Lord, repent, confess, and believe. That's always been the answer. In the Old Testament, they were saved by their faith in the Messiah who was to come. In the New Testament era, we're saved by our faith in he who did come and who is coming again. The question is, do you believe? So let me finish with one other story. Actually, this was published in the Our Daily Bread devotional many years ago. Our Daily Bread, of course, is published in Grand Rapids, Michigan. I don't know if you knew that. And it tells of a story that took place during the Spanish-American War. There was a woman who was working 
over, an oversight of a, of a relief agency, and they were stationed in Cuba. And one day an American colonel came to her. He wanted to buy food for his sick and wounded soldiers, but she said, it's not for sale. Well, he was troubled. His men needed the help, and he was prepared to pay for it out of his own funds. So he asked somebody else, why can't he purchase what he needs? He was told, Colonel, just ask for it. And then a smile broke out over his face because he understood why the provisions were not for sale, because they had already been paid for by someone else. By the way, the woman was Clara Barton, the founder of the American Red Cross. The colonel, a man named Theodore Roosevelt, future president of the United States. So, today I ask you, realize if you're still in the second era, you can't purchase your passage to the third era, but you can accept that Jesus paid it on your behalf and his forgiveness is available freely to all who repent, confess, and believe that Jesus is who he says he is. You see, life in the third era is a lot better than life in the second era, but life in the third era is your ticket to eternity in the fourth era. But the most amazing part of them all is there's a seat reserved in your name because Jesus paid the fare. The only question for you and I is do you have your boarding pass? That's the remaining question. And with that in mind, will you please pray with me? Oh Lord, as we weigh the effect of sin, which we will never fully know the half of. Let us at least consider that when we struggle with the question of why is it that not everyone comes to believe, essentially why do you save some and not others, help us to recognize, Lord, that the real question is why did you save anybody? You did so by your grace and your love, doing what only you can do, coming to pay the price on our behalf. Lord, I pray this morning that if there are people here who need you as their Savior and they, they have never really accepted that, may your Holy Spirit move on them this morning and may they recognize that, that your grace is freely available. And no matter what's happened in their past, it is sufficient for them. And for those who you have called to faith and we answered that call. May we never have a haughty attitude or a sense of entitlement, but in our sense of gratefulness, may we be ready and willing to share that good news properly, effectively, not, not in a way that creates barriers for people, but in a way that shows your love. Lord, give us our boarding pass, and may we be ready to accept and receive it. All of these things we ask in your holy name. Amen. Well, why don't we close with God of grace and God of glory, a classic old hymn. Same melody as Guide Me Now, O Great Jehovah, just a different text setting. Stand and sing together.
May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. As it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be. World without end. Amen.